Let's start. First of all, I'd like to add another book up to the list of references, Quantum Computing Explained by D. McMahon. I think this is a nice book for students because it has lots of worked examples. It's really uh, a good choice. I wasn't aware of it before, and I'd like to thank uh, Odita Sharma for pointing this out to me. It's, uh, I think this, uh, this will be a useful resource if you want to explore quantum computing further. In this lecture, we're going to, the first part of the lecture, we will consider our second quantum algorithm called Simon's algorithm from 1994. It is a, where we consider a function of n bits. Last time for Deutsch's algorithm, we considered a function of just one bit, a function of n bits where this, we will see that the quantum algorithm gives a speed up which is exponential in n compared with solving the same problem classically. The problem is artificial. Nonetheless, it is quite interesting and surprising, perhaps, that one can get an exponential speed up out of the quantum algorithm using the quantum parallelism. So we have f of x, where x is represented by n qubits, so it takes values, integer values in the range 0, 1, 2, up to 2 to the n, minus 1. We're going to start counting at 0. And we're told that f of x is equal to f of y, so we get the same function value if and only if y equals x plus bitwise addition modulo 2 times some number a. The goal will determine a. If I take, if I add a x bitwise 2 to this, you get a equals x bitwise plus y. So if I find a value of x and a value of y, where f of x is equal to f of y, then I can determine this constant a. That is my goal. So, so a is also in the same range, 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. So in other words, there are 2 to the n values of x, but only 2 to the n minus 1 distinct values of f, each value of f occurring just twice. So you could say this is a sort of periodicity. f of x bitwise plus a is equal to f of x. Notice this is not ordinary addition. This is bitwise addition modulo 2. That that's, will we'll make it relatively simple. So it's periodic under this bitwise mod 2 addition. The next problem we will discuss will be Shaw's algorithm, which is much more subtle, where we will be finding the period of a function which is periodic under ordinary addition. Much more useful, but a more subtle algorithm is required. So that may sound a bit strange, so let's give an example for n equals 3. So, x take values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And let me just write the th how the three bits are represented for each of these cases, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Because we're going to do bitwise addition, we need to know what the bits are, 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so that's x. And I've just cooked up some function which has the desired properties, and the values are 3, 2, 2, 3, 1, 4, 4, 1. Okay. So what is A? So we scan along and look for two values of x with the same function value. So this is the first one we come to. 
So f of 1 is equal to f of 2. So what is a? Remember, a is the bitwise sum of those two values, x and, x and y, here 1 and 2. So 1 is 0, 0, 1, and we do the bitwise add of 2, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. So in other words, a is equal to 3. And let's check that this works in other cases. For example, we also see that f of 5 equals f of 6. So in that case, if we take the bitwise sum of 5, sorry, that's 1, 0, 1, and 6 is 1, 1, 0. Yes. So the bitwise sum. 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 0, and the carry bit is neglected because it's modulo 2. And again, we get a equals 3. So, this is just a, a simple example. The problem is artificial and is clearly being cooked up to be solved by, by a quantum algorithm, but it is curious that it gets an exponential speed up. To see it gets an exponential speed up, let's first of all say what would we do classically? Well, you would, I don't know what else you could do other than just pick numbers. You at random or sequentially, x1, x2, x3, and so on, until you get an x, you get an x which gives one of the previously computed function values. So if we've determined m, the function for m values of x, we can consider all possible pairs to see if the function is the same for all possible pairs. There are m into m minus 1 over 2 pairs, which we can compare. And when m m minus 1 over 2 is comparable then to the number of possible values, 2 to the n, we might expect a reasonable chance of finding 2 to the, to the same. So we need something like 2 to the n over 2 x's before we'll hit 2, which give the same function value. Exponentially large in n. So for the quantum algorithm, which we will now discuss, we will see that the problem can be solved with only a little more than n function values. And I'll, we'll explain what a little more means, of course, as we uh, go along. So compare n and 2 to the n over 2, the quantum algorithm gives an exponential speed up. Okay. There is a, as we'll see, there's a, a, with this word a little greater than, we'll see that there is a probabilistic element to this quantum algorithm which is characteristic of many quantum algorithms. So, where are we? We, we're going to see that these Hadamard gates again play a big role. So let's 
make sure, or let's see how Hadamard's act, but we're going to need to apply Hadamard's to n qubits and see what the result is. So we're going to need to figure that out. So first of all, for one qubit, we know, let's just, just remind ourselves, h on 0 is 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1. h on 1 is 1 over root 2, 0 minus 1. And I can combine these two together by saying h on computational basis state x for one qubit, x can be 0 or 1, is equal to 1 over root 2, 0 plus minus 1 to the x. So I either get a plus sign or a minus sign depending upon whether x is 1 or 0 times 1. And I can even write it a little more compactly with that. I can do this sum over 0 and 1, as, write it as a summation, where some variable y, say, takes values 0 and 1. And what is the coefficient of y? Well, it's minus 1 to the x times y. Now, why is that? So the first term here, 0, that's y equals 0. So no matter what x is, this is, this is plus 1, and it, it's plus here. When y is equal to 1, I get a minus sign, but only if x is also equal to 1. So now we can consider n qubits. So what is... So let's write the direct product of n Hadamards like so. On some set of n qubits, which I will indicate when necessary by putting a subscript below the, the bracket there. What I really mean by this, let's write it out, what I really mean is h on x0, h on x1, up to h on xn minus 1. So as usual, we start counting at 0, and so the, la the last one is n equals, is n minus 1. So now we can use this expression here for each of these Hadamard operations. So there's a 1 over root 2 for n times, so it's 1 over 2 to the n over 2. And then for each of these Hadamards, we have a sum. We have a sum y0 equals 0 to 1, y1 equals 0 to 1, yn minus 1 equals 0 to 1. And then we have these minus 1 factors, minus 1 to the x0, y0, plus x1, y1, plus dot, 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 plus x, n minus 1, y, n minus 1. And then this will be... where we have y0 for the first one, y1, and so on, yn minus 1. So, so if I represent all these different y0, y1, and so on as a single integer y, 
So it's sum over y equals 0 to 2 to the n minus 1, where these y0, y1s, and so on are the bits of y. It's 1 over 2 to the n over 2 minus 1. Now I'm going to write this sum here as x dot y, I'll write that down in a minute, times the state y, which has n bits in it. Two to the n minus one. Thank you. So where x dot y is the sum x naught y naught plus x one y1 plus xn minus 1 yn minus 1. Now all that we need to know actually is whether this is even or odd. In other words, we only need the result mod 2 because we're taking minus 1 to that power and we just get one result if it's even and another result if it's odd. So this is mod 2. So I can I can also replace all these pluses in the sum also by mod 2 addition. So to, to check that you've you figured all this out, exercise for the students take n equals 2 and figure out, uh, figure out what you get. This will be a 4 by 4 matrix. And you have to just basically, the only thing to keep track of is the sign. So that's a simple, I think, exercise. OK, so we are going to, as I say, use these Hadamards. But we'll have a usual sort of function. There will be two sets of qubits, which conventionally we might call the upper set the input and the lower set the output, But a, because the input will contain x and the output at the end will contain the function. But as I've emphasized, both input and output appear both in the initial state and the final state. So what we're going to do is to start with all and our input, everything zero. And then we apply the n Hadamards. Now, if everything, if we start with zero, so all the x's are zero, all these signs are plus one, we just get the uniform superposition of all two to the n basis states. So if we look at what is the state of the system here, we have a uniform, this, this first state here indicates the input bits. And it's a uniform superposition over all possible 2 to the n states represented by the integer x. And for the moment, the lower qubits, the output qubits, we haven't done anything to them, so they're still in the state 0. So then we feed these in to our black box function, which I'm calling u, and what that in the usual way, this will evaluate the function f of x. Since originally the output bit was 0, what appears here is just going to be f of x. So we assume that we have our black box that will do this. For all x, it will compute f of x. And the state to the right of our black box, psi 1 then, will be a linear superposition, 2 to the n over 2, of sum of terms for which the input qubits contain x, 
and the output qubits contain f of x. And it will be a coherent linear superposition of this for all 2 to the n values of x. So this is where we're going to get eventually the exponential speed up because all these, this exponentially large number of funct function values are being evaluated in parallel. But how do we get information out when we do measurements? So the first thing we're going to do then is look at these output bits and we're going to do a measurement. Okay, so let's supposing in the output register we get some value, F0 say. What state are the input registers in? Well, they will be in a superposition of all the terms compatible with this value of F. How many of those terms are there? Two, because for each, each value of f occurs twice. So we measure the output qubits. We get some value f0, and there will be two values of x corresponding to this value of f, we'll say x0, say, and x0 bitwise plus modulo 2a. So, in fact, let's write this down. The input state, then, once we've done the measurement on the output, will be 1 over root 2 x0 plus x0 bitwise plus a. And now we've got to this point here. Supposing we then just measured the input qubits, we get either x0 or x0 plus a with equal probability, but not both of them. So I just get some number from which I cannot deduce what A is. Now, if it were possible to clone this state without destroying it, if I could make multiple copies of that state and measure each one, then I would have a good chance of sometimes hitting x0 and sometimes hitting x0 plus A, and then I could figure out what A is. But the no cloning theorem says that I can't do that. So what else could I do? Well, if I rerun the whole thing again, and I measure the output qubits, I will get, in general, some different value, f0 primed, for which there will be correspondingly two different values of x, say x0 primed, an x0 primed bitwise plus a. So again, I would have no way comparing the first run when I get either x0 or x0 plus a, and the second one I get x0 primed or x0 prime plus a. There's no relationship between x0 and x0 primed, so I still can't uh, obtain a. So, Adamard to the rescue again. We're going to, before we do the measurement, we're going to apply Hadamard's to the input qubits. Okay, so we're going to apply Hadamard's to this. Okay. So, direct product of n Hadamard's on 1 over root 2, x0 plus x0 bitwise plus a. Now, using the result that we had before, which I have unfortunately rubbed off, so I hope we can remember, so it's 1 there was a 1 over 2 to the n over 2 
from doing the Hadamards, but there's also the root 2, so it's 2 to the n plus 1 over 2. But then we have to sum over values y from 0 to 2 to the n minus 1 of, this is y. So then there was these minus 1 factors. So the first state is x naught. So it's x naught dot y, where remember x dot y is x naught x1 plus x, sorry, x naught y naught plus x1 y1 and so on, everything modulo 2. And then the second one is minus 1 to the x naught plus a dot y. So I take out a factor minus 1 to the x naught dot y, and then I have, I can factor this, uh, this the exponent here into minus 1 to the x naught dot y and minus 1 to the a dot y. Yes. X, that's right. Yes. So x naught is, is um, a string of bits. That's right. So I'm thinking of both an integer x and the individual bits x naught, x1, and so on that make it up, and similarly for y. So if I say take x equals uh, 6, this would have um, this would have these bits. So this would be x naught, this would be x1, this would be x2. This is the string that you get once you've measured the output qubits. And you get some function value f0, and there are two values of x compatible with that, x0 and x0 plus a. Because we said each function value occurs twice, and then the, the input registers then will be in this linear superposition of these two states. And to try to extract A, we apply Hadamard's to, to these states. And we see that there's an interference between the two terms coming from doing this. So that if A dot Y is equal to 1, remember the, all this is done modulo 2, so a dot y is either 1 or 0. If it's 1, then these two terms cancel and we get 0. So if dot a dot y equals 1, then um, we don't observe that. If we then measure after doing these Hadamards, the input gates, we will get one of these very many values of y, but which satisfies the condition that a dot y equals zero. Some y which satisfies a dot y is equal to zero. So in general, y will not be zero. You will be unlucky if you got zero. So you get a y with some of the bits non-zero. And you know what those are. You've measured those. non-zero, in other words, sum of the yi1. So what this tells you is 
that if I sum If a dot y is 1, these two terms cancel, so you don't see those. So you, the only t thing you're going to observe when you measure this state, which you're going to do next, is one of these values of y for which a dot y is equal to 0. Because the probability of measuring a term where I dot, a dot y is equal to 1 is 0. So you will measure with equal probability one of the values of y, for which a dot y is equal to zero. So assuming y i is not exactly zero, that would be unlucky, some of the bits of y are equal to one. And that means if I sum over the a i where y i is equal to one, the sum of these is equal to zero. So we've found one condition on this unknown constant A, which we're trying to determine. In other words, one of these AIs, for which YI is one, is determined by the others. So we've halved, actually, the number of possible choices for A. So now we do it again. And we go e do everything through. We measure the output qubits. We get some function value f, which in general be different from what we had before. We run the inputs through Hadamard's, and then we measure those inputs. And we will get another uh, value of y for which a dot y is equal to zero, but it will be a different one. So do, it, so do it again. There's a high probability when you do it again that you will not get y equals zero. That would be exponentially low probability. And also that you don't get exactly the same uh, y that you had before. So then with high probability, you get a second condition. And if you continue in this way, you can see it's at least plausible that if you do it n times, you will have enough information to determine the A, the, the, the bits of A. Now, it's not guaranteed that you will have enough information because sometimes you will end up perhaps with the same condition and it, it will, or, or, or a condition which is linearly dependent on the ones that you had before. So you have to do a bit of a probability theory to figure out what is the probability getting enough information to uniquely determine these A, all the bits of A, and that I'm not going to derive. I'm going to let you refer, discuss, for example, in Nielsen and Chong and Mermin, but if you do the probability, you find that the, that the probability of acquiring enough information in n plus p repeats, where p is just some number, is greater than 1 minus 1 over 2 to the p plus 1. That's a show that from probability theory. It should be plausible that by the time you get to n, where p is equal to 0, you have a, you have a substantial probability, in fact it's greater than half, that you already have enough information to uniquely determine the uh, a, but if you do n plus p, notice this expression is independent of n. So even if n is a million, you do a million, say, plus 20, you, there's only a one chance 
in, a, in, a, in two to the 20, which is about a million, that you won't have enough information. So with a number only slightly bigger than n operations, or calls to the function, you have enough information to uniquely determine this unknown parameter a. And this is compared with a classical result of um, e2 to the n over 2. I think what I was not making clear when I was discussing this is that I can think of a state as a bunch of bits. So this might be x0, this might be x1, and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, this would be x5 in this case. So I'm thinking of, you can label the states by the individual bits, but also this is a bitwise representation of an integer. And this integer is x. So I'm thinking both of the individual bits, but also the integer that's represented by those bits. Well, OK. So, so far, we've discussed two quantum algorithms. The first one, Deutsch's, we considered a function of one variable. And if we asked a particular question, we got a speed up of two. So there is some post-processing to be done, you are right, which is solving those, these are linear equations, so they can be done efficiently in polynomial time. So perhaps the classical post-processing is taking more time than the quantum side. The quantum took n plus a little bit operations. To solve n linear equations with Gaussian elimination, that would be n cubed. OK, that's a good point. But it's still polynomial compared with the exponential that we had for the classical case. Thanks for that good point. OK. So this is going to be a little bit involved. It will take the rest of this lecture and I think next lecture too. But I think it's, it's worth it. So let me give you a scheme of how we're going to proceed. The heart of the Shaw algorithm is an ultra-fast Fourier transform. So you know that uh, if you classically, if you want to Fourier transform a capital N or two to the little n quantities, the naive way of doing it would be two to the n times two to the n, but the equations can be grouped in an iterative way, so this is not classical, naive, but you can do, if you do classical fast Fourier transform, then it's much faster, it's n times two to the n, this is probably familiar to most of, or everybody, so with this quantum Fourier transform of Shaw, it's done in little n squared. So it's exponentially faster even than the fast Fourier transform. So this is the key. This is, this is the heart of it. Now, it's still not clear that, that you can use that for anything. But uh, as you can Im uh, imagine, Fourier transform, if you have a periodic function, Fourier transforming it will get peaks at multiples of the inverse period. So it can be used to find the period of a certain function, which I will, of course, discuss. So I hope you can see the connection between Fourier transform and finding a period. This period finding can be used, as we'll also see, to factoring integers.
And if you can have a really efficient way for factoring integers, you can break classical encryption codes such as RSA, which I will explain what that is next. The point is that uh, if you want to send information down, confidential information down the internet, it's got to be encrypted because people can sniff. And using standard methods of currently doing that, if you could have a much more efficient algorithm for factoring integers using Shor's algorithm, you could break these codes, which are used to encode, say, your credit card information on the internet. So, the ultra-fast Fourier transform is used in period finding, which is used to factor integers, which is used to break the encryption codes. Now, I think for the explanation, I'm going to do this in the reverse order. I'm going to start with encryption and factoring integers, and then find the period, and then show how we can do that with an ultra-fast quantum Fourier transform. Okay, so this, so we talk first about this, what's called public key encryption. So a popular way of method of doing this, which is due to Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman, RSA is as follows. Okay. So we have somebody whom we'll call Alice, wants to send a message down a channel which can be listened to, to Bob. How is that done in a secure way? So Bob sends to Alice a, some information which is called the public key. It's accessible to everybody. And this public key includes a large integer n, which is a product of two primes, p and q. So n is not prime, but it's a product of two primes. And this will be a very big number, maybe 600 digits, 2,000 bits. Not easy to factor by classical methods. More about that in a minute. And some additional information is included in this public key. I don't want to go into the details. So this is sent to Alice. Alice uses the public key to encode the message. So Bob sends the public key to Alice. Alice sends the encoded message using the public key to Bob. And now Bob has to decode this message. But the message cannot be decoded knowing only the public key. So Bob decodes using then the private key, which only he knows, which means P and Q separately. So since the integer n is sent along an insecure channel with people can listening in, if it were possible to factor n in a reasonable amount of time, anybody listening in could break the code and uh, decode the message. So in order that this is too hard to do, the uh, this integer n 
has to be very large. Say 600 digits or roughly 2,000 bits. And there are various uh, fairly sophisticated classical algorithms for factoring integers. And the best has a time which goes exponential in, there's some constant, and it's the one-third power of the number of bits. So little n is the number of bits. It's not, it's a fractional power of n, admittedly, but it is exponential in some power of n. So note the exponential. Shaw's algorithm will factor an integer in a time which goes like the third power of n. So if n is large enough, the polynomial algorithm will win over the uh, exponential. Okay. So, just, so, just, so this is why if you could find an efficient code to fact integers, it would be a big deal. Okay, there was a question. Well, th th there's a whole bunch of number theory which explains how this is done, which I don't have time or ability to, to go through. You just basically take the message as a bit stream, and I think to the power n or something like that, and uh, everything gets scrambled up. Yeah, there is a whole bunch of theory which says uh, that this will work. So what are we trying to do? So we've talked about RSA encryption and how if you could factor integers efficiently, you could break this RSA code. And how are we going to find a, a super fast way of factoring integers? So there's a way which seems pretty indirect and would not be at all efficient on a classical computer, but which works on a quantum computer, and it involves finding the period of a certain function. So we're going to have to discuss that. Okay, so this we're talking about the period finding method for finding the factors P and Q. These are both prime, separately prime of n. So n is p times q, and we want to factor it. So we'll just have to go through some operations which will seem to be bizarre to begin with, but in the end we will see how emerges a method for factoring n. Okay. So you pick at random. some integer b, going to be less than n, so somewhere between one and uh, between some random integer less than n, and which has no factors in common with n. So you choose some random number in that range. It, it can't have any factors in common with n. Of course, if it did have a factor in common with n, you would be incredibly lucky because you'd have solved the problem. And if you really want to be sure, you could check what are the factors in common.
using Euclid's algorithm. Okay, so we'll remind you what that is. So we want the greatest common divisor of two numbers. Let's say those two numbers are F0 and C0, with F0 the bigger one. So, in, so for example, if we have 24 and 16, the greatest common divisor, the greatest common factor, obviously, in that case is X. So in Euclid's algorithm, we iterate the following procedure. So at some point, we've iterated n times. We have fn and cn. And then for the next iteration, the next value of f is the previous value of c. And the next value of c is the previous value of f minus the integer part of the ratio of fn to cn times cn. So this bracket means the integer part, or the biggest integer less than or equal to that. So the integer part of 17 over 8, for example, is 2. We ignore the fraction. Is there a question? Okay, this is what we're going to start with. These are the two numbers that we want to find the greatest common divisor of. So we do this iteration. So we start with these two numbers, F0 and C0, and then the next pair will be F1 equals C0, and C0 is F1, uh, F0 minus the integer part of F0 over C0 times C0, and this is C1, and then we just keep iterating. So as you keep iterating, what you find is that the numbers decrease. And always, the F value is bigger than the C value. And also, Fn is bigger than Cn. Also, you can see that uh, any common factors are preserved by doing this. It's always some, the next lot is always some integer multiple of the previous Fs and C. So if, the, if at some stage Fn and Cn have a common factor, at the next stage Fn plus 1 and Cn plus 1 will have that common factor. Now at some point, Fn over Cn will be an integer. And C is the smaller value, and then at that point, the C will be the com common factor because it divides F. And the next value of C will be, if this, is a, if this ratio is an integer, you can forget about these rectangular brackets, and of course you get zero. So you, we'll see an example in a minute, but you iterate this down until you get a C value which is zero, and then the greatest common factor is the previous value of C. So let's just check that. So we'll do 33 and 12. So you can already see what the answer is, but let's uh, check how it works. So this is n, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And f and c. So we start with 33 and 12. Now, at the next stage, the value of f is the c at the previous iteration. So f1 is 12. And C1 is the previous F minus the integer part of 33 over 12 times 12. 
and this um, goes, this is, the integer below is 2, so it's 33 minus 24, which is 9. So you see that the numbers are decreasing, but always with c less than f. Do the next one. The next value of f is the previous value of c. The next value of c is the previous value of f minus the ratio Twelve over nine integer part times nine. This is twelve over nine integer part is one, so we get three. And then we go one more iteration. So the f at the next stage is the c at the previous stage, three minus the ratio of f to c. Ah, but that is an exact integer. So we get zero. So the greatest common divisor is the value of c at the previous stage, which you already knew was equal to three. But this is a systematic and efficient way of determining the greatest common factor. Okay, greatest common divisor. And we will use that again in a little while. So having by applying Euclid's algorithm determined that our number B has no factors in common with N, we are going to find what's called the order of B, which is the smallest value for a quantity R, we'll call it, such that B to the R is equal to 1 mod N. As I said, this looks pretty obscure at the moment, but it will um, turn out to be useful. So the mod N means you omit all the integer multiples of N and you just consider the remainder. So just so with no confusion, 7 times 5 is 35, but it's 3 modulo 8, because 8 fours are 32, we subtract off the integer multiple of 8, and the remainder is 3. So in other words, if we consider a function f of x, which is b to the x, and we evaluate it for different values of x. So x equals 0, we get 1. x equals 1, we get b. x equals 2, we get other stuff. And then at some point, when we get to r, we will find b to the x is 1 mod n. So since we just keep multiplying, if I multiply again, the next one, r plus 1, will just be b again. And r plus 2 will be whatever there was here. So you see that this function keeps repeating, this function b to the x mod n keeps repeating, and the period of the function is R. So we're going to give an example of this because otherwise I think it's fairly obscure. I'm going to choose as my example n equals 91. And we're going to figure out how to factor 91 and we choose a random number between less than 91, and I'm going to choose b equals 4. Yes, n is the number we want to factor. 
So n is p times q. We're given n. This is what we want to factor, and that's the number we're taking the modulo with respect to. So if we, okay, so then if we have x and b to the x mod n, x equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So b to the 0 is, so 4 to the 0 is 1, 4 to the 1 is 4, 4 squared is 16, 4 cubed is 64. Now, 4 to the 4th is 256. And 256, if I did this right, is 2 times 91 plus 74. So remember, we remove any integer multiples of n, n is 91, and we just have the remainder. That's what the modulo does. So this is 74. And then we have to take, do it again. So we multiply by 4 again. So 74 times 4 is 296, which is 3 times 91. 3 times 91 is 273 plus 23. So this is 23. And then we'll only need to do it one more time. So 23 times 4 is, if I didn't make a mistake, it's 92. But 92 is, of it, well, it's obviously 91 plus 1. So it's 1 modulo 91. So we found that the order is R equals 6. This is the period of the function b to the x mod n for b equals 4, n equals 91. So, why is this useful for anything? So we said R uh, is equal to 6, right. Okay, now, in order for this to work, we need to be a little bit lucky, but not very lucky. We're going to suppose that two things are true, and they are true with fairly high probability. Suppose, first of all, suppose that R is even, which in this case it is. Then, calculate b to the r over 2 mod n. And I'm calling this x. I realize now that's a bit confusing. It's not the same as the x that was over there. It's just b to the r over 2 mod n. So, in other words, x squared is b to the r. So, x squared... My, is equal to 1 mod n, so x squared minus 1 is equal to 0 mod n. So x minus 1 times x plus 1 is equal to 0 mod n. So when we say something is 0 mod n, what we mean is it's a multiple of n. So x minus 1 times x plus 1 must be a multiple of n. Now, x minus 1 cannot be 0 mod n. Why not? Because remember, x is b to the r over 2, but we said it was r that was the smallest value such that we got this result, that we get 1 modulo n. So x minus 1 cannot be 0 mod n. And then we're also going to suppose, second supposition, 
that x plus 1 is not 0 mod n either. And if you read Mermin, he argues or there's some theorem which says the probability that these two things are both true, that r is even and b to the r over 2 plus 1 is not 0 mod n, the probability is greater than 50%. So you have to be a bit lucky, but not very lucky. Supposing you were unlucky and either b was odd or b to the r over 2 plus 1 was 0 mod n, you would just choose at random another value of b and do it again. And since you have a greater than 50-50 chance each time of succeeding, you don't have to do it very many times in practice. Okay. So remember, if something is 0 mod n, it means it's a multiple of n. So x plus 1, x minus 1, is 0 mod n. So is a multiple of n. But if these conditions are true, we know that x minus 1 cannot be a multiple of n. And if we're a little bit lucky, x plus 1 is not a multiple of n either. But, but neither x plus 1 separately or x minus 1 are multiples of n. So where does this lead us to? So x minus 1 times x plus 1 is a multiple of n. So it's some constant times n, and n is p times q. But x minus 1 is not a multiple of pq, and x plus 1 is not a multiple of pq. So that must mean that x minus 1, say, must be a multiple of p, one of the factors p, and x plus 1 must be a multiple of the other factor q. So in other words, P is the greatest common divisor of n and x plus 1. And then the other factor, q, will be the greatest common divisor of n and x minus 1. So this is how the scheme works. It sounds rather indirect, and it is, and it will be hopelessly inefficient on a classical computer, but as we'll see in the next lecture, it can be done very efficiently in a quantum computer. Well, let's just, this is maybe a bit hard to follow, let's at least do an, our example and check that it works. All right. So our example is n equals 91. We chose b equals 4, and the period is r equals 6. So that means that b to the r equals 1 mod n. So x, what we're calling x then, is b to the r over 2, is 4 cubed, which is 64. So x minus 1 is 63, and x plus 1 is 65. So we are indeed lucky. The period is even, and x plus 1 is not 0 modulo n. So we get one of the factors.
We get one of the factors by taking the greatest common divisor of n, which is 91, and so uh, x plus 1, which is 65. Where you can go through the Euclid algorithm and you, I, I don't think I, I need to iterate through, you can tell that the answer is 13. If you want the other factor, well, either you can just divide 91 by 13, or if you can take the greatest common divisor of 91 and x plus 1, x minus 1, which is 63, and you, you go through whatever method you want, and you get 7. So using this rather convoluted approach, we have indeed factored 91 as 13 times 7. Okay, so this is the procedure that we're going to use on a quantum computer following Shaw to factor much bigger integers than that. So, recall, we want the period of the function b to the x mod n. Remember, n is p times q. b is a random integer less than n and no factors in common with n. So, for cryptography, n might be around, uh, have about 600 digits to be big enough that classical computers can't factor it, or about 2,000 bits. So, if we let n naught be the number of bits in n, so what that means is 2 to the n naught is the smallest power of 2, greater than or equal to n. So we will need, so n naught will be about, typical, for a practical example, about 2,000. So how are we going to proceed to implement this on a quantum computer? We're going to have to find a function which will calculate b to the x for an enormous number of values of x in parallel, from which we will try to find the period of that function. Okay, so as usual, the paradigm is we have two sets of qubits. Let's call each set of qubits a register. So we have an input register, which in the initial state will contain x. And an output register which contains the function values f of x in the final state.
So there's going to be some big black box, and we'll tell you in the next lecture what's in that big black box. So the so-called input register. And there will be the so-called output register. They're both present in the initial state. The output register will eventually contain the values of f of x, and we will need n naught. f of x doesn't get bigger than n because it's worked out modulo n, so we need n naught bits for the output register. Now, how many values of x are we going to need to calculate this function for? we're going to want to determine the period. Now, the, the period might be comparable to n. But in order to the, the Fourier transform will very sharply give us the period, we need many periods in the data. So it, 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 what you actually need is at least n periods, so n is something like 2 to the n naught, so the input values which will contain x will have n or 2 n naught qubits. So we get to, to, to do this in a useful example, we're already going to need something like 6,000 qubits. And in actual practice, because you need to do error correction, that will multiply enormously the number of qubits, so we're very far from being able to do that. Well, you want, we're going to basically Fourier transform to get the period. But if you only have one period in the data, the Fourier transform will be broad. But if you have many periods, you'll get a sharp Fourier transform. As we did with Simon's algorithm, we will input, put the input through n through Hadamard's. And the reason we do that is that then what's going in in the input is a superposition of all possible in states equally weighted, or if you want, all possible values of x. And what we want to get out here, and we'll call this, say, psi1, is The input registers which have n qubits will contain a value for x, and the output registers will contain the value of the function f of x with n naught bits. So f of x is b to the x mod n. So as x goes from 1 to 2 to 3, you have to keep multiplying by b, and always take modulo n. The, the input here, psi 1, psi naught, is just an equal superposition and we will put of all possible input states, and we will have initially zero here, zero here, but the Hadamards convert the input to all possible values of x will equal weight, and then this function here will compute b to the x mod n for all values in parallel of x that we need. So how many values of x do we need? Well, 
we need to compute b to the x mod n for x equals 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 2 to the n, which is 2 to the 4,000. That looks like quite a lot of multiplications. It looks like an impossibly large number of multiplications. But it's actually not so. And I think that this will be the last thing I'll say because we've covered quite a bit already. You, you start by, you compute B. And then you square it. You get B squared. Then you square it again. You get B to the fourth. Square again, you get B to the eighth. And so, you can get up to b to the 2 to the j with only j multiplications. So if you want to get up to 2 to the 4,000, it only needs 4,000 multiplications, not 2 to the 4,000 multiplications. So if you want then, if you have all these num values stored, it's easy to compute b to the x for some value of x that's not a power of 2. So let's write the bits of x as x does n bits. These x's are 0 or 1. So if we have b to the x, for each of these bits that's 1, we need one of these factors. So we need a product over j of b to the 2 to the j if xj is 1, so if you want to the power xj. So you need to compute these n quantities and then from that in a small number of operations you can get b to the x for any value of x. This is called modular exponentiation. And that will be an important ingredient of Shor's algorithm which we will complete tomorrow. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Sorry. What is it, R equal to 6 in your space? Yes. Uh, so after we get a value greater than the value n, so uh, 4 to the power 4, 256, then we got modulo whatever that is 74. You take modulo of an n, so which was 91, so you subtract B? integer multiples of n and just keep the remainder. Yeah. So after that point, we didn't take a higher power of b. Uh, like, then uh, after we got the new remainder, 74, so that became our new B or what? I didn't get that part actually. No, B is 4, but we have to multiply the previous value by B each time. Right, okay. it's B to the X. Each time we go increase X by 1, okay. we multiply by B. Okay, we choose a higher power of B until we... Uh, we keep multiplying by 4, always doing it modulo N. Okay, okay. I did, before we go, I did have a comment, if I could make that. So, I realize that um, I'm not going to have time in the lectures to talk about the second paradigm for quantum computing, which is quantum annealing. There's quite a lot of activity on that. So, what I thought I might do is, in part of the tutorial sessions tomorrow and Friday, talk a bit about quantum annealing. Hope that will be okay. Uh, break for lunch and meet at 2.30.